So I was talking to a friend of mine about this talk, and he said something that caught my attention. He told me an idea this extreme would automatically put him off. I thought to myself, wow, is this an extreme idea? I mean, if anything, I thought people would think of it as being utopian, something too grand, something that will work in theory, but has no real practical implications. But it also got me thinking about how we use the term extreme. If the idea of a world without money is extreme, then what kind of words would we use to describe a world with money? Moderate, safe, are these the words you think about when you think of your relationship with money? Or do you automatically start thinking about how much more of it you need to meet your next goal? Maybe it's to buy a house or start a family. Maybe it's more immediate things like paying this month's rent or getting enough food. Now that you're thinking about money, are you feeling a bit stressed out, anxious? Well, you're not alone. Money issues have consistently ranked as the number one cause of stress and anxiety in the US and the UK. The thing is, most of us don't put an inherent value on money. We think of it as a means to an end. But we also understand the type of precarity we'd be in if we don't make enough of it, whatever that means for us. Since we know we need money, we're willing to make sacrifices over what we do to get it. We'll take up jobs we're not happy with, put up with bad bosses and colleagues. We'll take that unpaid internship in the hopes to get a paid job. And some of us will even take out student loans to study things we might not necessarily want, but things that we hope will give us a better chance in the future to earn a living. The thing is, money doesn't just impact our own choices and decisions. It also interconnects us all through competition. We all compete for the opportunity to work. And through this competition, we've built a system around it, a system we like to now think of as a science. We call it economics. But this, but this competition also means that many of us will lose access to some of the basic needs. Some of us will automatically be pushed out through this competition. Now, some countries have governments that say no. No matter how much money you make, or whether or not you have the opportunity to make that money, you should always have your basic needs met. Here in Scotland, for example, healthcare and education are for the most part covered. For those who need more assistance, there's things like food banks, shelters, and subsidized housing. The thing is, even these systems that are put in place to counteract the coerciveness of money are themselves coerced. How many times have we heard of the term balanced budget in the news? Governments find themselves in a position where they're balancing between those who own the resources and provide the jobs and those who actually fulfill the jobs. So things like money supply, creating jobs and inflation become what the government does instead of directly meeting our needs. But even with all these attempts to control the economy and to try to make sure our needs are met, Every once in a while, and with increasing frequency, we have a financial crisis. And every time a crisis happens, even more people are left without the resources they need. But let's say we don't want to look at money through the complexity of the government and the economy. Let's say we want to look at it through its exchange value, right? That's how most of us look at money. We use it to exchange goods and services. Well, even then, aren't we trading our time for money? Does that mean we don't even own our time? Isn't that where the phrase time is money comes from? And then are we all working with the hopes that eventually we have enough money to buy our time back, to buy our freedom back? Isn't that the concept of a pension, of retirement? So no matter how you look at it, money is an extreme idea. On an individual level, it forces us into decisions we might not otherwise make. As a society, it forces us to compete against each other. And it even paralyzes our government from being able to meet our needs. But what's the alternative here? Do we go back to a bartering phase? Well, here's where it gets interesting. Anthropologists the world over agree that the entire barter phase of the economy we think about never existed. Societies have always existed 
on an implicit or explicit understanding of debt or favor. And everything has been used as currency, from construction nails to feathers and seashells. Where trade existed, it was between societies and not as individuals bartering within it. So if you want to think about a world without money, it's not to go back to some kind of mythical barter phase of the economy that never really existed. We need to move beyond the idea of exchange altogether. A world of equal access. A world where everything from housing, food, education, and even the things we consider as leisure, such as entertainment and technology, require nothing in exchange. A world where all of these things are absolutely free. Now I know what you're thinking. This is absolutely insane. If there's no money, where's the incentive to work? Why would anyone do anything? And we'd all be fighting over the same things. Well, let's break that down and think about it. When it comes to your work, why do you do what you do? Most of us want to become doctors, engineers, musicians, or ecologists because we understand the value that gives to society. We want to be a part of moving things forward and improving the quality of life. It might also be our passion and a way we find meaning from our lives itself. But see here, we've already fallen into the trap of thinking of work as an exchange. How many of us in our free time also volunteer or give to charity? We do these things not expecting anything in return. We do them because we understand we belong to a society and we want to play an active role. But let's say we don't believe in any of these noble aspirations. In a world without money, all we'd want to do is follow our own passions. Well, wouldn't that eventually also benefit society? Think about every great inventor out there. Did they do what they do for money? I mean, of course, they made money out of it, and we value that in our, on every entrepreneur today. But I doubt Alexander Bell created the telephone thinking, oh, I'm going to make my quick first million. A world without money would also mean that many of the jobs we have today become unnecessary. Banking, insurance, and finance, all things that are meant to either manage money or try to create more money out of money itself, become unnecessary. Instead, the jobs that will gain significance are the ones that hold social values, the ones we need to survive, and the ones that make life worth living. Work on these things will be voluntary. People will be motivated by a sense of responsibility towards themselves and society. We'd be able to structure our work in a much more democratic way. Imagine you can elect your boss or choose what you can do within your company, where that company should go. And since now there's no more competition over money, you can start working with other companies to push innovation forward. And these structures will be built on a regional level and then on an industrial and national level. So a world without money doesn't mean that work will stop being done. It just means that why and how we do work will change. The social reasons of why work exists in the first place will naturally rise to the top. A world without money also doesn't mean anarchy. Our conception of anarchy is tied to one of the core principles of economics, that we all behave in a way that maximizes self-interest. So we need something like money to control us, to keep a lid on things. But I ask you, is this a fair assessment of human nature? Or are our current trends of hoarding and you know, just keeping all the wealth to ourselves a result of this system, a system that puts money before anything else? If we didn't have to think about money, would we be looking to hoard it or just look to improve ourselves? None of us look at ourselves and think, oh yeah, I'm the greedy hoarding type. So why do we quickly accuse others of this behavior? Well, this ties into another economic principle, that of scarcity and competition. We compete for scarce resources. But if we know anything about our world today, especially here in the West, it's that not much is scarce. Advances in agriculture in the US has meant that we are now overproducing food and that things are being dumped on the international free market. In England alone, there are more than 600,000 empty housing units 
some being empty for more than 10 years. And then across the world, automation doesn't only mean that jobs are being replaced and we don't need to show up to work, but that jobs are being done at a much more effective rate. If we've reached these levels of advancement, then why are we still showing up to work? Couldn't we all find better ways to give into society than be part of a system that overproduces? As for the things that remain scarce, well, we can use the power of democracy to decide where they go and what we do with them. I mean, we might all want Lamborghinis, but that doesn't make sense. That's just wasteful and unnecessary. We can use the power of democracy to decide where our resources should go and what we do with them. Of course, to be able to make these decisions, we need to technically own our resources. They need to be held in commons. Only then can we be the sole decision makers on what happens with them. If we owned our products in common, then we'd also liberate the government from its current balancing act. Instead of trying to balance between those who own resources and those who make the goods, the government's job will become to help us identify our needs and meet them directly. It will become to help us organize into the work groups we just talked about. And through these new systems of governance, we can continuously push for innovation. I mean, if we're the ones doing the work, I mean, I'm sure we'd all want to do less of it, right? And here we can lean on technology, which will also be held into commons, to continuously push for innovation and do less and less of the work ourselves, instead of how technology is currently held in commons and behind trade secrets. Communal ownership may sound like a strange idea, but it's already a part of our colloquialism. Think about community gardens or rooftop solar panels. We think of these as ways to become more self-reliant, but they're also ways for us to take control away from large, centralized, and private organizations. They're a way for us to benefit directly from the resources we have. Communal ownership has also been tried on a much larger scale in places like Spain, Italy, and Mexico, where entire industries have been run under commons, from agriculture to manufacturing. These experiences have not only taught us how to better self-organize, but also how to make sure power isn't abused. Ideas such as industrial syndicates or any and all elected officials being subject to immediate recall have helped us build more egalitarian societies around the world. The question then becomes, how are we going to get to the society with no money? Well, some people think it's not going to happen until all of us say, enough, that's it, we need something better, and have some kind of uprising or revolution. Others think this can happen through government slowly buying over private stocks and organizations, also, called as also known as nationalizing. And the third school of thought thinks this will happen through empowering employees through labor unions and building workers' cooperatives. The ideas and real-life examples of a world without money are as diverse as the ideas we have of our current world with money, yet they're continuously thrown aside, even though we know we're going to have to relook at our relationship with money as automation takes over our lives or our work. But even if automation wasn't happening and there isn't this impeding force, wouldn't an idea of a world without money be worth pursuing just to counteract the extremes that a world with money has created? A world that has convinced us we need something external to us to control and motivate us? Don't we deserve to see ourselves as something more than that, as individuals to be empowered by our natural resources, to give into society based on our natural abilities and take from it out of our needs? I think it's about time we look at these, these ideas with a bit more consideration. Our future just might depend on it. Thank you.